Dog day. 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 You can either be a work of art or you can wear a work of art. I mean, that sort of encapsulates it. The great man had sort of pinpointed it. And that was the idea. It was sort of grassroots rather than haute couture. It was a small little world, you know, and it, it wasn't that commercial. It wasn't created by Versace or, or the fashion stuff. It was there screaming at me to say, come on, make me a flower jacket. And um, the Rat Pack kind of sharp, modish tailoring was eased off there by that time. Everything became softer, more romantic. One has to realize that it was only a few years before that that a pink shirt would be considered really risque. I think carefree is a good word to use about the changing fashion of that time. I think the main thrust of it was maybe the fact of boys dressing more like girls. I think it went hand in glove with the, with the peace and love thing, you know, a, a more gentle society. It was very gentle. It was a gentle time. Even though we were going through a very tough time, this movement of love and peace that came was just wonderful. I think the 60s kicked off the whole idea that music and fashion were interconnected. All the musicians wanted to be designers, the designers wanted to be musicians, and it really became a big part of a musician's persona, their whole stage presence, their whole aura. And the clothes and the music were, were, were like that. They were such a strong image. It was as though we were all surfing the same wave, whether we were photographers or musicians or clothes designers or hairdressers, and people were embracing it. And people were excited and turned on and switched on. And it was gear, it was fab, it was wonderful. There's a kind of thread that's happening exactly the same way as what the music was happening. Everyone's taking their ideas from each other and it's all growing organically. The Buddhists call it synchronicity. Everything just happened to be in the right place at the right time. It wasn't manufactured, it wasn't designed, it just happened. You didn't have to have an app on your mobile phone to live. You just lived. Certainly at the time when I was designing clothes, I, I, I saw it that it could be quite revolutionary. We never thought that we'd be talking about it in 50 years' time. London in the 60s was happening. It was the center of the music world. It was the epicenter of all the cool things that were happening. I mean, there's just so many pieces of clothing that are iconic, and they still look amazing today. Androgyny has set him free He's a masculine, feminine prodigy Silk scarf is wrapped around his neck Patchwork satin discotheque He's a daffodil in the latest clobber If looks could kill, he'd beat Jack the Ripper Girls and boys, they both want his number Passers-by, they always say he's quite the bloody dandy You know he is, you know he is So do kids so do the kids You know he is You know he is A dandy with a passion for fashion A dandy with a passion for fashion He's a dandy with a passion for fashion You know he A dandy, 
I think it's a kind of um, foppish poseur, someone who really takes an interest in their appearance. It's a very private business between you and your client. He could be a king, he could be a waiter, he could have a hunchback, he could be a psychopath. But, so there it is, you cover the waterfront, you meet everybody. I finish school when I'm 15 and I think, well, the only way I'm going to get this suit of my dreams is if I learn how to make it. So I walked around Savile Row from one shop to the next until I got to a very famous establishment called Henry Poole. The cutter said, go and sit over there, young man, on the couch. And as I'm sitting there, a very famous English actor called David Niven walks in and I'm watching from the couch all this wonderful um, conversation between David and his tailor. And I thought, well, this is going to be the best job I could ever get and uh, I'm going to meet stars and it's going to be fabulous. Anyway, the, the cutter said, come here, young man, we've got a job for you, but it's around the corner. You've got to go and see Mr. David, uh, who will make an apprentice coat maker out of you. I was there for a couple of years, never meeting any stars, but getting to work on their coats, even royalty, like the Duke of Edinburgh and Louis Mountbatten. I decided that I wanted to go traveling and uh, into Europe. Shortly after I came back, I ran into a couple of kids who had a basement full of old clothes. One of them was trying to sew and fumbling around. I said, well, this is how you do it. They said, oh, you know about this, do you? I said, yeah, of course I do. They said, well, how would you like to be a partner with us? We plan to open a shop. It's going to be called Granny Takes a Trip. I was a student at... Uh... London School of Economics and University College London studying economic history. And then I got into about 18 months of freelance journalism from a little office. That actually was the building on the King's Road. When that business went bust, I took on the lease and it became Granny Takes a Trip. And the fashion thing wasn't so much that I was into fashion as my girlfriend, Sheila. And she collected vintage clothes and they were piling up. And I thought of the name Granny Takes a Trip and because Granny Clothes and, you know, the dopey association with acid and all that. But, it, you know, it was a funny, funny name. And it was a woman's shop to start with. Granny is a woman. <laughs> I was just hanging around London. I have been working a bit in the theatre uh, in London. It was ASM, just like behind the scenes. Then this guy called Jay said, why don't we make some clothes together? He knew the scene more than me. And he was in touch with these guys like Granny Takes a Trip and Carnaby Street. He knew all the places. And then we just go and select material and then have outworkers run up these shirts and um, other tunics and a few other things. Um, for as cheap as possible, and then we just sell them around the stores. I mean, it was just really small scale. But you know, the rock and rollers were interested, and people like Jimi Hendrix and Brian Jones and that. If we brought them something that we just made a few of, they loved it because A, they didn't really like going to shops and shopping, they didn't have that much time. And secondly, they wanted to buy something exclusive. But I mean, London was a lot kind of smaller place then, you know. It was not difficult to knock on people's doors. I mean, I already knew a few people. The designing of it was just, we saw the material and we go, oh, that would make a fantastic tunic. Largely, this material was like just cloth that would have been used for women's dresses. You know, but of course, men would never have had shirts made of women's dress cloth before that. But because it was 1966, that was fine. One day I was up in the uh, Studio A control room at Olympic and I got a phone call from the office downstairs and it was the studio manager. And she was tough, wonderful lady named Anna Menzies. And she says, she was very English, very British. She said, oh, Eddie, there's this American chappy with the big hair and you do all that weird shit, so why don't you do him? And I thought, oh shit, okay, here we go, right? And he sat in the corner, it was a very cold day, and we got all set up. Then he took his jacket off, of course he had 
fabulous shirt, and I can't remember what color it was, but I was, oh, check this guy out. And then he plugged in and was like, oh, shit, Jesus Christ, this is unbelievable. Listen to that sound. How the fuck am I going to record this? And that's how I got to meet Jimmy. I had a job at Vogue House on Hanover Square in London in the accounts department making tea. I was only 15 and stuffing envelopes and taking mail around the company, Vogue, the magazine. And one day a model didn't turn up to the sixth floor where Vogue Studios are and I had a note on my desk, would I come up to the studio and stand in for some model who hadn't shown up and that's how it all began. You know, I danced on a program called Ready Steady Go, which was uh, the sort of hit program on television at the time. And that was always very sort of fashion influence. So it was kind of in my blood anyway. I was invited over to California in the summer of 1966 for three months. And my father said that if I earned my spending money, he'd pay for my fare. So with a girl from college where I was studying at the time, we decided we'd start making clothes. So we made shirts and things, which the mother of a friend of mine at school made for me. And then I disappeared to California for three months and didn't really think any more about it. When I went to California, I actually saw the Rolling Stones at the Hollywood Bowl and saw Mick performing in one of my satin shirts, which was quite a buzz. And then when I came back, I had all these phone calls saying, where the hell have you been? You know, we need more stuff. And I thought, well, I don't actually know what I'm studying at college, so I'll be a clothes designer, which is kind of what happened in the 60s. I refused to live in the past, but I'm glad I grew up when I did because it was such an era of opportunity. And if you wanted to do it, you could. I fell in love with photography through um, a chance meeting with the actor Peter Sellers, who was a friend of my father's. He came to our house when I was about 13 or 14, and he brought with him a full Hasselblad camera kit and a large format Polaroid camera. And he took some photographs of me and my brother with the Polaroid, which were just incredibly magical. But then the sort of turning point for me was when he showed me the Hasselblad, taking it to pieces, putting different lenses on. And he did the entire thing in a crazy, mad Swedish accent. And I was just in hysterics. And I just associated photography with Hasselblad and fun. And from that moment on, I was going to be a photographer. I was a stylist by trade. That was how I started in New York. My husband, who was a photographer, We'd go down to the village and photograph the village all the time because we lived in a village. And one day he came home and said, I found this shop that you might really like and you should go, you may want to get yourself a jacket. And so I went with my friend Stella, we went to look at the shop and there were four or five guys that made the leather jackets, beat it with fringe and the pants. And, and they were really, really good. They had learned how to make it with American Indians and they were, real hippies. They were just lovely, lovely people. I ordered a suit and they had to close the shop because they couldn't afford it anymore. And there was an empty shop across the street. And my friend and I looked at each other and said, why don't we open a shop? So we did, then we took them with us. The guys who were making the leather stuff we were in the basement making fringe jackets. And uh, it was all set up perfectly for them to do what they knew how to do best. In those days, nobody had a brand. We just had an address, 321 East 9th Street. And it was word of mouth and everybody knew about it. And we traveled to London, we traveled to Paris, we traveled to Morocco and brought back one of a kind. We would go to Granny Takes a Trip and buy from there. We would go to Paris and buy from other designers and everything was original. The Fillmore East was right around the corner. So everybody would walk over. It was like two blocks away. Johnny Winter was there a lot. Miles Davis was there every day. Cher had a coat made in our store. Jane Fonda was there. Santana was there. Oh my God, there was so many. I was always a bit of a peacock when I was young and you know, uh, you know, my mother could never touch my clothes. When I left school, I worked for a local menswear shop, and then I discovered Carnaby Street. Then I met a guy called John Paul, who just started Lord Kitchener's Valley, and uh, I joined him in Portobello Road. 
and we worked together for a good few years. I then got a shop in Water Street and that's where Jimi Hendrix walked in one day. I'm an opportunist, I suppose. I just had an instinct then if I knew it was right. When I left school, um, my parents forced me to get a job and uh, I went and worked in uh, a department store in Knightsbridge called Woolens. I was a good salesperson and John Crittle offered me a job when he said he was opening up in Queensgate Mews. All of a sudden, I didn't have a management hierarchy on my case. I just had John Crittle who just sort of said, get on with it. It was totally liberating. There I was sort of listening to all this music in the store and I was still living with my parents and getting a bus down to the King's Road every morning. I was sort of given the honorary title of manager of the shop. The reason I was manager was because I was the only one who could get up in the morning out of everybody. I was lucky to live through it, I think. <laughs> it's another one of those long, strange trips on how I got started designing clothes, for sure. Um, mostly because I, um, as a kid, um, was inspired by music artists like Keith Richards, Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, and not necessarily literally wanting to look like them, but kind of their thought process and bits and pieces of how they looked at things. Um, so I went to school, um, I got a degree in education, but I worked my way through school, all the way from high school, all the way through college, uh, working in men's stores. And um, I kind of got addicted. I was into music from about the age of 11. It was the blues that got me. My father worked for the BBC and he could get any record that was issued. And I used to nag him to get me all the records that I heard on the radio. Lightning Hopkins, Elmore James, Muddy and Albert King, Freddie King, BB King, all the Kings. Really, I was a American blues aficionado. With the music, you know, when you hark back to the 50s, to the blues times, the jazz times, these people that were playing this music, they always looked so sharp. Well, my mother, she told my father, people, mm -hmm, I was born. Afro-American music from the South is really the matrix, is the bedrock of American music as we know it today. And it comes out of that um, harshness or that, you know, wanting to fight and, and celebrate life. I think it was true in, in Britain at the time. You know, there was a lot of anger, a lot of uh, despair, and it was gray and miserable and and young kids they suddenly heard elvis and the beatles and they said no no we're gonna dance america was the place um and me like everybody else i wanted to be american i didn't want to be british but the funny thing is is this 60s sound was basically american music which was repackaged and sold to the rest of the world especially america and they all fell for it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Granny Takes a Trip started off as a vintage clothing shop with Sheila Cohen's collection. They're all looking to the past. The, the inspiration comes from the past. And again, that, you know, Paris, if you think about what was happening at Paris at the time, you have people like Courage that's talking about futuristic fashion. We're looking to the futuristic hard edge plastics, stuff like this. All of these people are looking to the 20s and the 30s. Suddenly Paris was out of fashion. In Milan, they were behind. They were really quite straight, you know, the Paris fashion. Once you start to get into the 60s, it's about being young and about being exciting and about having clothes that you, you can move about in, you know, that you can dance in. It's, no one wants to wear corsets anymore. The haircuts came in with the freedom of the fashion. So you get Mary Quant. Uh, came in with the short skirt, then you've got the hair, the short skirt, all this geometric look. 
there wasn't really any men's fashions. It was just you wore the same clothes your father wore. And actually women wore the same clothes their mother wore until Mary Quant. The way that uh, rather young adolescent girls, you know, really 12, 13 year olds, walked and moved with that ease and grace, in fact, more like dancers, was much more attractive than the sort of rather paralyzed, stilted, high-heeled walk yeah. and hobble skirt walk. But it seems it's mainly very young girls who wear the miniskirt. Do you think they mm. have this panache, the ability to carry it off majestically? But who wants to be majestic? It wasn't high heels and all that. It wasn't women, you know, looking terribly sexy for men. It was about women being liberated, having kind of comfortable clothes that were fun, that were bright and colorful. And it was just about more freedom. For girls as well, it was a much more casual. We didn't have to have handbags and shoes that matched any longer. We didn't wear little pillbox hats. We were able to be more free. And when Bieber's came along and had little cotton dresses, it was tempting to go without shoes and be just carefree. Carnaby Street, when it started, it was really just John Stephen. And he, he gave his address as Regent Street or something, because nobody knew where the hell Carnaby Street was. It was just a little tiny road on the back of Regent Street. It was a backwater. The clothes were kind of a little bit Italian, a little bit preppy. They were classic cuts, you know. In the early 60s, you're either a mod or a rocker. You either rode a motorcycle, which made you a rocker, like Marlon Brando in The Wild One, with swept back hair and leather jacket. That was a sort of retro look already. Or, you know, like the small faces. They were the classic kind of mods. Slim fitting trousers with Cuban heel boots, Ben Sherman shirts and quite tight jackets and short cropped hair, quite short hair. That was the modern look. It was quite American, really. You dictate the fashions yourself, do you? No, I wouldn't say that we dictate the fashions. We attempt to guide where possible. Um, most of the, these uh, the boys and the, the girls who come to us, they have got ideas of their own, set ideas of their own, and most of them have got very good taste, which is much more than their parents and their parents' parents had before. In 1966, when Time magazine coined the expression swing in London, placing Carnaby Street as the heartbeat of the swing in the 60s, of course, the whole world invaded Carnaby Street. Once it kind of took off, a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon. And soon Carnaby Street just became, you know, crass, sort of rubbish, people just trying to cash in on a trend. I mean, this is what happens. As soon as you produce something interesting, a lot of people copy it, and then it just, oh God, no, please. As much as we were not anti, but we were playing against his enterprise was John Stevens and Carnaby Street, which to us looked a little bit um, too structured and you know, too much like rag trade. There was John Stevens and his clothes, and they were really good. And there was a, a really good shop there, Kleptomania, which actually was run by Tommy Roberts and Charlie Simpson. But it was shortly after that that, I mean, Carnaby Street became quite a sort of tourist destination, so lost its kind of uber coolness. I'm not putting down Carnaby Street in, in any way or measure because what was happening there was amazing. But you had a group of people on the other side of town that really didn't want to be part of that. They wanted their own thing. And being more well-read, they had more of a grasp of art that had happened in the past. We just wanted change and we were curious to see new things. And, you know, we'd all read our Aldous Huxley and Timothy Leary and we were beginning to read our Jack Kerouac, the Dharma Bums, and, and then follow that up with a bit of Eastern philosophy or whatever. And it all came together. It was all part of the stew and the zeitgeist of that time. Back to Oscar Wilde, as Nigel says, you know, Written above the door in Granny Takes a Trip was one should either be a work of art or wear a work of art. You know, and that's an amazing statement. <laughs> Do you mind this interloper? My last shop, which I opened in 1968, was called The Universal Witness. 
the universal witness actually was my take on the fact that fashion should be looking at everything and absorbing everything. So that was my sort of maybe pretentious way of seeing it. It was also a chapter heading from a Madame Blavatsky book, The Secret Doctrine. And as I and several others were into psychic phenomena at the time, we were making more one-off pieces, limited editions, than, than the um, Carnaby Street, which had more or less become mass market by that time. And we were more expensive, for sure, more exclusive. The main difference with what was happening on King's Road, I'd definitely say, was more artistic. It wasn't for a commercial gain. And then along came Mary Kwan and Bieber's and all these wonderful English designers. And of course, it moved from Carnaby Street after 67, which was the summer of love, to King's Road. Infiltrating into Westminster, the land of division bells and Tory MPs, the family man, and incidentally, the most way out, Michael Seth Rainey. Go on, Saffron. Got to get up now. I called my baby Saffron because materialism has taken over Christianity. Therefore, I don't think that Christian names like Michael, David, John, and so forth are really part of 1967 any longer. I met Jane five years ago, and that's when most things started happening in my life. We've now been married seven months. We moved into this house the day that the baby was born. It was a very strange coincidence because it was as though now that there was a house, there was a house for baby to be in. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's all rather disorganized. The extraordinary thing is that my father who's been in the army all his life practically, five years ago more or less ordered me to go and have my hair cut. And um, he's begun to come round to thinking about it in a completely different way. Not so much just the fact that, oh no, you can grow your hair long, but by feeling that we should be allowed to have our freedom. Hung on you most probably is within the King's Road, the dandy side of the boutique, Ground Zero. It was opened by Michael Rainey. His mother was a very famous socialite. Michael had spent some time working for Celia Birtwell at Quorum. He was well known for being a snappy dresser. He didn't go to fashion college. He just had a good eye and he had a good idea of what he wanted. Michael Rainey's hung on you was a beautiful shot and he did beautiful clothes for men. He was a real dandy and he was a Lovely guy. I only considered Hung on You as being on the same level. Really. The other shops were, were wannabes. Michael Rainey, I mean, I think they, their clothes were just wonderful. But again, it was that rather Edwardian look. It was like, you know, they, they'd be doing sort of shirts and things out of interesting materials, but they'd be just beautifully made. I mean, I think Hung on You and Granny's, in my mind, were the coolest. The guy Hung on You and John Pierce. They had a craft and they knew how to make things like those hung on you jackets that were really well made and stitched like old, like a proper jacket. They weren't sewn by outworkers in Bangladesh for nothing. They were very traditional sort of clothes only. They started saying, well, let's have a velvet collar and let's have these big buttons and let's make them like a frock coat. They just started having new ideas. The tailors I worked with on Savile Row, who I thought I might get involved in the project at World's End Chelsea, they came down there and they looked around. They said, what the hell do you think you're doing? You haven't got a chance down here. Little did they know that the people were queuing up uh, to get in. So. We were in the right place at the right time. The address was Granny Takes a Trip, and we were in a little area in London called the World's End, opposite the World's End pub. So it seemed to me you could have a, a psilocybin mushroom, which was a sort of a symbol of an atomic mushroom cloud. It's just a, a joke, a, a visual pun. Rumour had it was if you licked the label, our Granny's label, uh, which was a magic mushroom, you would go on a trip anyway. 
<laughs> false. <laughs> that wasn't the case, but that was the label. Supposedly, if you lick the, the mushroom label, you'd be uh, sent on a hallucinogenic trip. Being lucky enough to own a few granny's uh, garments myself, I have tried and to, to no avail, it didn't work. <laughs> and I think, yes, the um, hallucinatory effects of that drug was definitely an influence. Purple, purple haze, <laughs> and purple suit, and purple room. Head explosion, ballistic explosion. <laughs> when Nigel and Sheila opened, when they had their first mushroom label, they had a grey label with the mushroom. When Freddie took over in 69, he had the red label. It still was the same design with the mushroom, but in red, because there was less stuff made within the Nigel grey label period. A lot of those pieces are harder to come by. The idea of taking a furnishing fabric and using it as a man's jacket. People had done it before, but to me, once you have that jacket and you go, it's got that Granny Takes a Trip label in there, you know. To put that jacket with that label and that mushroom <laughs> on the label all together, you're saying something totally different. You know, when we're talking about, okay, it's a movement, but it's a countercultural movement that's starting to gain a whole movement there. And, I mean, you can't get away from the drugs reference, really. I mean, it's... <laughs> to actually see someone walking around in what would have been a curtain would have been mind-blowing. Any number of people could be there, but nobody's going to say, can I help you, sir? Or what are you interested in? It was just left to you to prove yourself <laughs> to be cool enough to be shopping in the store. It was totally anti-selling. <laughs> a lot of clothes there. It was lovely. It was lovely. It was a fun shop and they really had beautiful things. I love Granny Takes a Trip. It was fairly dark inside because purple walls and marbleized paper um, and uh, blown up French postcards of saucy girls. And in the back we had a big old world. It's a jukebox. There were many stores in Chelsea. I think Granny Takes a Trip was like the, the queen bee of that one. I remember Granny's, yeah, I remember it well. Late afternoon, it would be a bit of a hangout. There was really no question that we weren't um, at the cutting edge. You know, you had the Beatles, you had the Stones, you had the Who, you had Jimi Hendrix, Cream, a whole gamut of everybody who was everybody. We were playing around visually with all sorts of things, with the clothes and with the shop itself. Beginning from day one, it was the It Girl Theda Barra, and uh, that then was followed by Mae West, and you could only see into the shop then through her lips. That lasted a little while before the um, Chelsea football crowd got angry, having lost that Saturday, and took it out on the window. So that then led to Geronimo, and that was a huge blow up of a photograph put onto blockboard and that was the last of the glass windows followed by the car half a dodge com coming out sadly that led to some friction with my then partner because he wanted a cosmic star scene and i wanted skyscrapers painted on the backdrop as if it was just crashing out of new york city you know going to granny's i, I thought wow jimmy had a shirt like that oh, let me try this and i got my hippie shirt and i got a little beanie hat and oh dear oh and bees as well and oh dear oh dear it really got out of hand you know <laughs> Little Kitchener's Valet. Now, this is a strange name for a shop. Can you tell us exactly uh, why this name was chosen? Yeah, well, you know, Lord Kitchener was a general in 1914, 18 war or something. You know, he was the one who said, your country needs you. Uh -huh. But more or less, it just, you know, fits, fits the fits style, the of style and the sort of period of the clothing. Uh -huh. How long has this kind of fashion been going now? Well, it's been roughly about six months. About six months. Yeah, well, how long, long do you give it? How long do you think it'll last? Well, it hasn't really started yet. I give it to really start catching on this summer and last through till next summer at least, you know. Mm -hmm. I should imagine about 
two years, two or three years. Uh -huh. But then again, there's always, we aren't, aren't only going to keep selling military stuff, we're going to sort of always buy different clothes, they'll always be made clothes, something different, but with something completely outrageous. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we always keep military stuff, though. there's always uh -huh. people who have always worn military stuff. Und I understand uh, several people have been arrested in London for wearing this type of clothing. Uh, can you tell us why this is? Well, they say something about, you know, current buttons, which, uh, if you're wearing an old jacket and new buttons, it, you know, it's an offence to wear current buttons. And uh, you think this fashion then will catch on? Yes, yeah, definitely. I definitely think so. You do? Uh -huh. We can't breathe. It, you know, some days it's just ridiculous. So Weekend, many people. Weekends are queuing up outside to get in. Really? Well, uh -huh. about 10 o'clock, there's always a, you know, a dozen or so people waiting uh -huh. outside to come in. What type of jacket is this? It's a beautiful one. Well, this is a Hussars, actually. It's Royal Hussars or something yes. like this, yeah? Yes, yeah, it's about 100 years old, you know. 100 years old. It's Are these uh, very expensive? Well, this is the only one that I've really come across uh -huh. and I've bought it. It's more or less an antique piece. And now, tell me tonight's bill, the Federal Stars of 1967, the Jerry Hendrix Experience. This particular jacket was so special that I actually grabbed it as my jacket. And I used to wear this jacket in the shop nearly every day. And every rock star from Eric Clapton onwards at the time wanted to buy this jacket from me. But no one, I didn't want to sell it because it was my, my, my own personal jacket. Jimi Hendrix, of course, came in the shop when he just arrived in London into the shop in Water Street. And he wanted it. And I said, it's not for sale. So he came back and offered me more money. And then he came back and offered me some more money. And then he came back and offered me quite a lot of money. I said, OK, take it. <laughs> it's yours. There was a lot of army surplus military gear, firemen's uniforms, naval uniforms, all that kind of stuff dotted around Chelsea. And that was cool, too. I mean, Jimmy picked up his military jacket, you know, that, that famous jacket that looks amazing on him. And the, the closest I came to that was I had a fireman's jacket that I brought with me to, to America. We had a war in Suez in 56. We had the Korean War. We had all these things going on. And we had an empire all around the world. And there were warehouses all over England full of uniforms, which you could get hold of. But somehow they found their way into the retail shops in the UK. But the really fancy ones like Hendrix wore and all the, the one Mick Jagger wears and all the really fancy ones, they were officers' uniforms. And they were a limited amount because, you know, not everybody's an officer. So as time went on, Kitchener's needed to, to expand. And it was sort of like a mixture of uh, clothing and a hippie shop. You know, you could go and buy a caftan and uh, your incense in the same place. Couldn't buy your drugs, though, because we didn't sell dope. Initially, some of it was retro. You know, like Jimmy wore those old army jackets from, like, that they were very old. They weren't like real army. They were like when, when army jackets were red, you know. It really was a finger to the establishment, but I don't think it was intentionally started like it became like that. So, you know, once they started protesting, like everything else, you know, all published is good publicity. You know, he was wearing an old military jacket or band jacket, that type of thing. In a way, it's kind of costumey to wear that today. But something about Jimmy, even though he was wearing, in a way, a costume, it felt like he owned it. Since then, people have saying to me, well, if you had that jacket now, I'd be worth a fortune. In reality, if he wouldn't have bought it off me, it would just be in another jacket. I think the real reason it became this special was because he wore it all the time like I wore it all the time. I believe it's now resides with Stephen Stills. My understanding was that Brian Jones had sort of taken him under his wing and introduced him, not necessarily to Lord Kitchener's valet, but certainly to the Kensington market, because a lot of people, a lot of musicians were buying these old vintage clothes, a lot of them women's clothes. And the interesting thing for me is that looking back, I don't think he ever looked as good again, to be honest with you. I think that there was an authenticity to him at this moment in time, a freshness, a wildness. The Chelsea Antique Market was an indoor market on the King's Road. Upstairs in a little back room, it was eventually two back rooms, uh, these two people, Vern Lambert and Adrian Emerton, had a, a clothes shop and they started off by selling old clothes 
and then they morphed into selling new clothes, including a lot of the things that I designed. People got those Indian bedspreads, which were cheap, super cheap, and then you sewed those up as tunics, sort of three-quarter length. And it wasn't necessarily fashion, it was the migration of some people going to India for enlightenment, uh, etc., and coming back with these things. Uh, and they were just easy to wear, you know. I was the person who designed whatever anyone else says, the first caftans that hit the mainstream in, in, in that period. And the first caftans I made were actually floor length with a half belt at the back. Adrian was slightly more conservative and he said to Vern, who was the outrageous one, he said, oh, we can't possibly have these. They look like men's dresses. And Vern said, yeah, we've definitely got to have them. So they bought the six that I'd made and I think they sold out within half an hour. And I think George Harrison bought two, Brian Jones bought one. I'm not sure if Mick bought one. They all went to, to rock stars. It is strange to see pop musicians with sitars. I was confused at first. It had so little to do with our classical music. When George Harrison came to me, I didn't know what to think. But I found he really wanted to learn. The thing where I got involved with India, anyway, and for me it was the meditation. Meditation was the key to uh, releasing all the uh, anxieties and frustrations, you know, when the nervous system gets wound up. My sweet Lady Jane, when I see you again, your servant am I, and will humbly remain. Just keep this plea, my love, on bended knees, my love. One of the nicest things about that particular short space of time is that you could be rubbing shoulders with young aristocrats and working class boys and nobody, you know, you were just passing the joint and everybody was giggling and laughing and, and it was fun. And, and so it wasn't strict and structured and conventional and it was anti-conventional. The aristocrats wanted to be more like the working class, whereas the working class wanted to be more like the um, aristocrats. Well, Tara Brown and the Guinness family, you know, they're wealthy people and wealthy people. <laughs> A person like Tara Brown, Guinness heir, spent his younger years living in Paris. His mother was famous for being a socialite and interested in the fashion industry. I think her third husband actually opened a couple of boutiques within Paris. Hence, Tara had an understanding of fashion. He moves to London. He gets to know the Beatles, Paul McCartney. With having money and influence, you know, he can easily get into these happening clubs that were opening in the early 60s, like the Cromwellian. Converted Victorian mansion in Kensington, where the groups come to let their hair down, both literally and metaphorically, where the in crowd are conspicuously in, and the out crowd just aren't allowed in. It's called the Cromwellian. Nice irony because of the bacchanalian lack of purity. Having spirit and curiosity and imagination, it cuts across. It's a human thing. It's not a class thing or a wealth thing. It, it just, you've either got it or you haven't. It's like talent or something, you know. And Tara Brown was not conventional. He had lots of money in the background, uh, but that didn't stop him from being curious and imaginative and wanting to enjoy life, not in the same way as his expected to do. John Quirtle had worked at Hang On You when he first came to London from Sydney. That's how he found the jacket makers, a company called Foster's, which Tara Brown bought into. 
and it became Foster Tara. They were recognised as the best makers of the Regency frock Victorian jacket. When John Crittle opened Dandy Fashions in mid-66, Cliff Foster was still making clothing for Michael Rainey and Hung On You. So that's why a lot of the clothing looks very similar. It's hard to differentiate other than the label because a lot of it was made by the same person. It was almost like a surprise when people came in, but slowly but surely because of John Crittle and Tara's connections, people would start coming. And as an 18 year old, those guys were in their mid twenties and they were on a different social plain to me. We were in a tiny shop probably for about six months before we got the bigger store on King's Road. Anything from taxi drivers to King's were coming to our store. We'd only just opened the King's Road shop and he was on his way apparently to meet Bender Edwards and Vaughan who were painting the front. They'd done John Lennon's Rolls Royce and he got in a car crash on Redcliffe Gardens on the way down, killed instantly. That was absolute tragedy, really. We, you know, we hardly opened the doors when that happened. From that incident where he was killed, was famously um, incorporated in one of the Beatles songs, A Day in a Life. You know, as we have in England, or all countries, don't drink and drive. You know, don't drug and drive as well. You know, and I think he drugged and drived and he did blow his mind out in the car. He blew his mind. He didn't notice that the lights had changed. That left his family, the Guinness family, owning a portion of a shop that they weren't particularly interested in. And the Guinness Trust guy came down and he said, Well, haven't you got books and you know, aren't you keeping records and you know, and you're like, oh my God, this is a headache, you know. And eventually um, their position was bought out by the Beatles, Apple Corporation, the old Apple, not the new Apple. And then it became Apple tailoring after that. I left at that stage. And the beautiful people of London made their flower power way to Beatles, George and John's with it, Aladdin's Cave, only they call it Apple. It's a new kind of boutique in Baker Street, catering for specialised tastes. George and John described their new venture as a kind of psychedelic Garden of Eden for lovers of hippie gear with all the trappings of beautiful living. After explaining that, George thought he'd take it easy. He was lucky he could find the chair. So he settled back to listen to the latest kind of shop-warming music as played by the group who designed the store. They call themselves The Fool. I think they saw an opportunity to have an investment in, in something other than music that was creative and, and uh, it was an obvious move to take over dandy fashions and move it to Baker Street and get uh, the fool involved as designers. And it was one thing where they weren't ahead of the game, they were behind the, behind the game. Uh, the music was much better. Uh, their clothes were pretty horrible actually, they were, they were sort of a bit ridiculous in the fool. I really liked their work. I mean, their graphic work was fantastic. The front of the shop was fantastic. And actually, before it opened, all of us who were sort of individually doing it thought, oh my God, you know, this is it for us. The game's going to be up now because people will just buy this stuff. But I mean, actually, their clothes were pretty ridiculous, to be honest. I don't think I knew anyone who wore their clothes. And I knew people who were quite prepared to spend lots of money on clothes. The Apple stuff kind of, um, it's a bit bonkers, really, I always think. It's like you had to be really out there to, to, to wear it because it's it, it takes it one step further. To wear a whole tapestry suit, it's almost like wearing your sofa in, in, in a way that the furnishing fabric isn't. But I kind of like the creativity of it, the stuff that The Fool did at that time. Fabulous. It's psychedelia at its best. Well, when you actually walked up to the Apple Beauty, you were welcomed by a wooden hand. That in itself is just an amazing innovation. And inside you had just like an Aladdin's cave 
of wondrous clothes, the colours of the rainbow. It was almost like they were going back to the medieval times. There was nothing that they wouldn't try. It was almost like some of the clothing you could imagine it in a Robin Hood film. It was spectacular, to say the least. It would be an ultimate dream for me to have been able to walk in those doors into the shop. But right from the start, which is kind of a thread that happened with the King's Road boutiques, they were using expensive fabrics. The Beatles, they weren't business people. They had no idea of how much these things were costing. Like, it's well known that the actual Apple boutique labels were made with silk and these were incredibly expensive to produce so sometimes the labels would be just as expensive as the actual garment that they were adorning so straight away it was a recipe for disaster that was their headquarters where the press office was there and things were happening there deals being done and uh, apple was becoming like um, a hippie dream beatles had this beautiful idea that if you've got the talent they'll back you. Unfortunately, it was a lovely thing because people used to rip them off left, right and centre, but the thought was fantastic. And, um, and you've got to recognise that. Clive Epstein or some other such business freak came up to us and said, you've got to spend so much money or the tax will take it. We're thinking of opening some retail... Chain of retail clothes or some balmy thing like that. And we were all muttering about, well, if we're going to have to open a shop, let's open something we're interested in. You know, we went through all these different ideas about this, that and the other, and we ended up with the... Paul had a nice idea about opening up a, a white house where it would sell white china and things like that, everything white, you know, because you can never get anything white, you know, which is pretty groovy. And that it didn't end up with that. It ended up with Apple with all this junk and the fool and all their stupid clothes and all that. And, and then, I don't know, I, I was controlling the scene at the time, you know, I mean, and I was the one going in the office and shouting about Paul had gone up. Paul had done it for six months. I walked in and changed everything. But they're all, all the Peter Browns were reporting behind me back to Paul saying, hey, you know, John's doing this and he's doing that. And like, John's crazy. I was always the one that was, must be crazy because I wouldn't let him have status quo. When Paul used to come in, it was like, oh, honey, man. You know, everyone was sort of smiling and Ringo was all joking and George was just drifting through. You know, he was quite cool. But I always noticed that when John Lennon came in, it was a bit like, you know, it's like the headmaster coming, oh, better sit up, you know, oh, make sure you know, Lennon's walking, because obviously he was a bit moody. And uh, we, I came up, the, uh, was it my idea or yours? Well, we came up with the idea to give it all away and stop fucking about with psychedelic clothes shop. So we gave it all away. Paul's brief excursion into shopkeeping is over. They say they're now rather tired of this particular toy. <laughs> When they first came, the Beatles were, well, they had these funny Liverpool accents, which was okay, but they were different. And then they had to sort of catch up with what was happening in London. You know, their music was initially quite poppy and all that. I wouldn't say the Beatles were trendsetters. They weren't trendsetters. They were a bit square, you know, because they wore those Beatles jackets and all soon changed. A matter of probably months. Now, between 62 and 66, a few things happened to the Beatles. <laughs> Experimental little things, probably. So the time I got to see them, they were individuals. They had this, what you call a beetle mop haircut. And it was like about, you know, it was like just over your ears like that. And, but it was a kind of mop. It wasn't a haircut. And it wasn't long, but it was longer than what ordinary straight people went to office work had. So it was definitely another kind of style. And that was in the early mid 60s. If you look at the album, Let It Be, they're full haircuts, they're full boom, 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 boom. All with their hair looking wild, whatever. Now I can remember doing it, you know, I can even remember saying to, you know, somebody once, they were my haircuts. And someone made a great remark, which was, what do you mean they were your haircuts? Doesn't look like they've had a haircut. Well, that is such a great compliment. The whole point in those days was you could cut your hair they looked like you never cut their hair. That was a secret. 
Once the Beatles left their sort of Pierre Cardin Beatles suit era, it was just so interconnected. I mean, all the musicians I admired, they all wore the kind of clothes I and we wanted to wear. The Beatles were wearing in the beginning when Brian Epstein put them in those Pierre Cardin suits. But they soon dropped all that for the stuff we were making. You know, they, they weren't going to be told. If you think of the Beatles, being the Fab Four, you know, and they're all wearing their, their, their Dougie Millin suits or whatever, and they all look exactly the same with their little ties. And it's a great image. And then, you know, we start to see in sort of 65, 6, and we're starting to see them as individuals, as different people who dress differently. Well, obviously, by the time we get to 67, we're fully fledged here, you know, as, as psychedelic individuals. And I see that moment of them moving from a pop group to a rock band. The clothes are an essential part of that. The great thing about the Beatles was they were natural. And also my hair at the same time, my hair was like theirs. Their hair was like mine. So it gave me a lot of, um, I didn't feel sort of uh, under pressure. It was a great time to be around that environment of fashion. The way that I met the Rolling Stones was my girlfriend from school at the time, Sheila Klein, was going out with Andrew Oldham. And Andrew Oldham was um, getting the Stones together. And so I met a lot of the artists through Andrew. Yesterday don't matter if it's gone. While the sun is bright Or in the darkest night No one knows She comes and goes I wanted to get away from the very regimented look, the very show-busy look, the sort of glittery teeth and the frilly shirts and the, the shiny 8x10 glossy. For me, that was old school, old hat, old style. And I wanted to try and do something that was grittier and grainier and funkier. And the Stones were the perfect band for me. So I was overjoyed to be asked to work with them. They just would go on stage wearing what they were wearing in the street, as far as I know. I mean, they don't do that anymore. They've got these fancy costumes. So obviously, your street wear had to be quite hip if you were going to show up and stage it. And like their image was sort of a bit bohemian, studenty, that sort of thing. Mick and Keith had a sort of vaguely art school studenty look. Bill Wyman was always had a style of his own that was perhaps a little older. And Charlie was always hip. In many ways, he looked the sharpest, like a New York jazz, cool hipster. But Brian had the rock and roll look. He had the pop idol charisma. So there were two different types of looks if you wanted. If you wanted to look smart, you could look smart. If you wanted to look at the Brian Jones. It was really Brian Jones was the, you know, was the dandy. Legend had it that he went into Harrods and started ironing his hair on, the, on an ironing board in there. It's very interesting if you look at Keith in the first session, and then you look at Keith towards the end of the American tour the same year, so there's about eight or nine months between them. The difference is absolutely enormous. So one was acutely aware of a change that was evolving on an almost week by week, monthly basis. I always think that the Stones have a slightly uncomfortable early psychedelic period, but then they ease into that Aussie Clark look, you know, and they kind of rock in then, you know, <laughs> that new move where they go somewhere else. One of my best friends was a des fashion designer named Ozzy Clark. And Ozzy Clark was a great designer. Ozzy would take me everywhere. When I would go to London, he would say, you know, let's go and look at this place. Let's go and look at it. And that's how I find the Granny Texas Trail. Because I didn't live in London. But if you had a, somebody that was from there and was in fashion, you knew where to go. He was a sort of um, star fashion pupil at the Royal College of Art. And then he opened uh, his boutique with his wife, Celia Birdwell, 
They both came from Manchester area. He'd have wonderful fashion shows. Alice Pollock and Ozzy Clark, two of our way out trendbenders, invited us to their autumn fashion collection. They also invited Yoko Ono and John Lennon. He's on the left. The theme is the 1930s and 40s, but the treatment's definitely the permissive 60s. It was amazing. I mean, I wore a lot of Ozzy Clark. Ozzy Clark to me was my fashion idol. It was haute couture, you know, and all that that means. It was, it was tailored specifically uh, for for a high end market, and um, they were flowing. They were beautiful gowns, beautiful ideas, wonderful prints that Celia dreamt up, and so yeah, it, it was a different concept than you know what we were doing or how the new was doing. It was, the, it was the Ozzy Clark stuff that really started to grab my attention. And I think actually mainly because of Celia's prints. They, they really seemed to stand out to me. They were so beautiful. But at the same time, they're, they're amazingly strong. And, and the use of the space around the print was just incredible. Incredible. I, 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 it just really hit me. It was so attractive. Well, he was a very complex character. He could be very, very funny and very generous, and then he could turn and be the exact opposite and be rather dark and um, moody. The cut of his clothes was superb. He made women look elegant and languid. It was, um, he just had a way, and I think it was to do with the way that he tailored the clothes and cut the clothes that they fell so beautifully. If you have a, a length of crepe fabric and you cut it on the bias, i.e. on a diagonal, then it actually fits to the woman's body. It sort of hangs in a way that just sort of literally follows the contours of the body. And that was what he was a master at. And apparently he could just do it, you know, I mean, most people would have to have, you know, follow a pattern and really do it, but he could just do it completely instinctively. His clothes were just beautiful. Only an exhibitionist would cultivate this sort of style. Put a skirt on them and I go out with them. <laughs> They're usually accused of exhibitionism or being dirty and uncouth. But get to know some of them individually, follow them through a working day, and generalizations are apt to wear thin. When fashion changed and exploded and people discovered psychedelics and everything just exploded, and that was quite... Uh, a new thing because men hadn't had long hair since about 1880 or something. I think the short-haired, short back and sides boy was needing to deny his tenderness, needing to deny his attractiveness to the opposite sex. Girls always liked long hair. They liked it through history. And if you talk to a girl nowadays, they will all agree that they really do like boys with long hair, uh, well-groomed, well-turned out. They like boys to be handsome. They also like to stroke boys' hair. And it's very difficult to stroke a bristly Prussian crop. I think the older generation are fixated on short back and sides really as a way of saying, I simply do not understand young people anymore. It's as if they use hair as a demonstration of their total bewilderment, total lack of contact, total lack of awareness as to what is going on with young people. And I think underneath this, there is an enormous envy on the part of the older generation for the younger generation. Instead of having short hair, men had long hair. And then men wore kind of more outrageous fashion things than women. I mean, there wasn't really a demarcation between men's and women's clothes. I mean, you could go away wearing a dress if you wanted to. It was very endogenous. Every, everything was flowing, you know, men would wear scarves, long scarves. Like in London, you had all those scarves, those narrow scarves that everybody would wear. It was so lovely. It was like very Edwardian looking. It was very feminine for men and women. The clothes on the rail were mixed between genders. Long before LGBT, you know, you'd have a men's suit next to a woman's frock. That sort of vaguely androgynous look where, you know, if you look at pictures of Keith, at this point in time, Brian, Anita, Marianne, 
mix. They were all merging. Their androgynous images were all, they were interchangeable. They were wearing each other's scarves and shirts and trousers. And Jimmy just took this look as though it was all made for him. Why do you wear your hair like that? Yeah, well, these hair strands here, each one stands for a vibration. And they're all supposed to be good. But oh, there goes a strand there. There was a girl involved who was quite astute called Linda Keith. And she knew musicians and she knew stuff. I think it was Linda Keith who told everybody about him. I don't know how she heard about him. The Stones were on tour, so I was hanging out in New York while they were off on tour and Keith would come back to New York and I was just hanging out, going to clubs. And Jimmy was playing with uh, Curtis Knight at the time when I first saw him. The club was the cheetah. He was amazing. He stood out. His playing was fabulous and there was nobody like him, I didn't think. I just thought I loved the tone of his guitar. I liked everything about his playing and I needed to hear more, so I introduced myself and we got on. Chas Chandler, who was the bass player in The Animals, who had left The Animals and now was on a new career path. He wanted to become a record producer. He heard things and he said he wanted to express. I didn't really know Chas when I introduced him to Jimmy. I just bumped into him in a club and I happened to be at the same table as he was when he was saying he wanted to get into management. And I said, aha, I've got just the person for you. And that's how it all came about. So he comes down one night and Jimmy is actually playing Hey Joe. And Chaz freaks out because that was the exact song that he had thought of for another artist that he was thinking of producing with that song. Chaz had heard the song and wanted to record it with somebody. And then Jimmy came up, I think he opened his set with it. And he sensed that he could have a great success in the UK. And so he persuaded Jimmy come to London. I guess he paid for Jim because Jimmy didn't have two cents to rub together. And so the stars just lined up perfectly like that. He said, right, you're coming with me. And he got him a passport and he said, you're coming, you're flying to England. We're, we're going to go make some records. And that was the beginning of Jimmy's career. He crashed down to this earth. Like, where did this come from? From another planet with a left-handed electric guitar strapped around his neck. And he was a colorful personality. Um, he was a man of color. And his music was also full of color as well. So I think he had a big effect. And in his wardrobe, it was always flamboyant from a color standpoint, um, which I think shook a lot of people up. and shook some shit up at the time in terms of what was possible for people in their wardrobe as well. And I think it, it suggested that there was a freedom to be had in style. He used colors to describe sounds. He would say, hey man, I want some of that green, you know, that kind of green sound. You know, oh, green, yeah, I know what that is, that's reverb. And we had these code words like, yeah, purple is more like sort of a murky kind of distortion, and red is really when the distortion is flying, you know. Just colors. He wanted colors. It was great when Jimmy was here because, you know, he did blow the place a bit wide open. He brought a kind of breath of fresh air into it. You know, he really upped the musical stakes, you know. Wow, this guy can do that. Hold on a minute. There was a very early point when Chaz turned to us and he said, the rules are, there are no rules. And his lovely Northern accent. And we got it. We understood immediately this was the key. This was the key to the, the kingdom of sound, if you will, because it just kicked open the doors and we could go, we'll do anything. I call it sort of like a, a world electric gypsy look. You know, it's, it's kind of all put together. But a moment of genius, you know, the, the, the velvet trousers, little Hungarian waistcoat or whatever, you know, and it's, and it's a 30 scarf maybe, and then this fabulous Hussars jacket over the top, you know. And it all comes together in this amazing image. And it's still, you know, it's still a rock god image today. I just felt that Jimmy created his own look. He wasn't like a coat hanger, you know, that he actually took things from here and there and put them together himself and came up with his own look. You know, he could take a sort of piece of fabric or a scarf and tie it around his knee and, you know, suddenly it became something else. The hair, you know, that, that image of him 
coupled with his music, you know, had, had tremendous power. I have my picture and we're sitting in my office and he's the big icon right behind my desk here. Jimmy's been my fashion icon for sure. I think he, he his style and his approach to fashion was something that I think transcends generations. You know, truly, in fact, in my opening, I don't know where my book is, but in my, uh, in my thank yous in my book, I think the first person I thank is Jimi Hendrix. So, um, you know, it's kind of like the one that kind of set me on thinking that you can do your own thing, you know. Working with Jimi at Olympic was so inspiring because every day when he came in, he was dressed to the nines and it was always like, oh, Nice new outfit, nice new outfit. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. And, and in, in the end, I just thought to myself, you know, every damn day he comes in, it's a fashion show. And, and you just, you never knew what he was gonna be wearing because he never wore the same thing twice. Not that I can remember. Oh, if I didn't have any clients, I used to wait downstairs and downstairs was all the material. While I was down there, Hendrix came down with John Crittle down there and they were talking and whatever. And, Obviously, he was um, going on tour and he was measuring him up. I think he must have had a jacket already made for him. He put it on, he was altering it, how do you want it, whatever he, the design was. And when he had finished it, he said, how is it? And he said, yeah, that's good, that's good. He said, um, right, uh, what colour do you want him in? There must have been about 100, 150 pieces of material. And he said, I'll have them all. And I went, he said, yeah, I'll have the lot. So he had a hundred and something jackets made in all this material. Not a normal customer, good customer. <laughs> good, had a good day that day, he did. John's mother uh, slept in the shop when she came over from Australia one night. She missed her hotel. And when she woke up, she thought she saw an angel. And it was actually Jimi Hendrix coming up the stairs. Uh, and the light behind his head looked like a halo. I was doodling on the serviette making some sketch and somebody tapped me on the shoulder hey man this is really cool and it's jimmy lo and behold i'd already seen him play i saw his first gig at a little dive called blazes he got up and blew the house down playing guitar with his teeth and his wildness on stage was not reflected in his personality off stage. He was very quiet, he was very humble, rather sweet-natured and gentle. Oh, he was a very nice person. He was very shy, but he was very funny and he was very kind. Yeah, he was shy. It's funny that, isn't it? The showbiz people who, uh, who once they come alive, it's a sort of Jekyll and Hyde thing. The switch goes on, on, on stage and they become the performers, you know. When he hit the stage, it was like, wow, something clicked in and he was animalistic and forceful and just on top of it. It was amazing to see that transformation. That's the yin and the yang that I love to watch and love to see and love to feel. There was this girl called Julie and she used to paint, she used to get silk and stretch it on a frame and then she'd draw these colors on it with her inks. And she made these ties, so they were kind of like these psychedelic ties all one-offs, all different. Jay, my partner, he might have suggested it. He said, why don't we get her to do something more than that, like a jacket? She painted some plain tie, silk ties. They're almost like very basic kind of psychedelic face, faces and, and forms. I think it was a lot of Indian inks that she was using. But Julie went on from the ties then to make these amazing jackets that were worn by Mick Jagger, John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix that were full on psychedelic. And on the front it had these two eyes and each eye had two pupils, which was like, wow, was that a bit alien? And then lots of other colors and everything. And it took a long time to make this. It was a big job. <laughs> You know, he loved it in England because he could be himself and do whatever he wanted to and no one was going to criticise him. He, he wasn't sort of part of a black culture. He was just part of what was going on in London. And also, before that, I don't think black guys wore stuff like that. 
the more crazy he'd like it. I think he was an extraordinary musician who had a fantastic sense of his own individuality, who happened to be around at this extraordinary moment where all these things came together and he embodied that look of that moment. On the west side, there was a club called The Scene where a lot of musicians went. And I just happened to be there with a friend of his. And we were opening the shop the next day and he came down and the jacket was one of the first item in the shop. He saw it, loved it and bought it. And that's the jacket that he ended up wearing at Woodstock. Jimmy was unique. So he was an icon no matter what. What is philosophy, fashion, music, songwriting. He was an icon. And uh, I think it all, it's all into one. You can't separate one from the other. And I think he was an incredible talent. So, you know, that doesn't die. John Lennon and I were having dinner with somebody who was a dentist, and he dropped LSD in our coffee and we took it, and ever since then, it's all changed. Well, you know what they say, if you can remember it, you weren't there. So, I mean, you, I mean, it's like asking somebody who's hung over, what was it like last night, you know? Acid was more dangerous back then because it was usually in liquid form rather than in a dosage. So you never knew how much you were taking, really. It was on a blotting paper or sort of stuck in a salad or something like that. So I, I, it was kind of weird, but, uh, and a lot of people did lose their minds. But I think it did make people want to dress as, and be strange and are strange, you know? I mean, taking acid to me was a major event. I mean, I found it a very significant thing to do, but I had friends who used to take acid and go to the cinema. And I thought, how did you, how would you do that? You know, it's sort of, so I, I guess it's like everything in life, it just depends how you react yourself. But we were certainly all on a kind of quest. I mean, looking back, maybe a little bit pretentiously, but we didn't see it as that at the time. I mean, we, you know, it was a mind expansion and yeah, we, we wanted to see how far we could push our bodies really. But in retrospect, it was more charming times then. I mean, it was before the more aggressive drugs took over. The most powerful drug in the 60s wasn't, wasn't LSD, it was the, female contraceptive pill. Girls could now have a great time and behave like how they wanted. They could tell boys to piss off, you know. They didn't have to worry. I think that was very important, the peace and love thing. I mean, it, it sounds like a joke, but in actual fact, uh, as a world movement, it seemed fantastic. I mean, it was the 60s. Everybody was friendly. It was love and peace, you know, what's better? Then love and peace. People were friendly to each other. The aggression was gone for a while. And, you know, and everybody's walking going, peace, man, fire out and cool. And even the bank manager, my bank manager used to go out with me. He liked to smoke a joint. Tobacco was 100% normal. Everybody smoked everywhere in public transport, in cinemas, in theatres, in restaurants, breastfeeding babies, everywhere. People smoked. So smoking grass or smoking hash just felt normal. I mean, we knew that it was illegal and that you don't really do it in the street and you, you know, it's something you do in private, but it felt harmless. It was fun. It enhanced the music. It made you laugh. It made cornflakes taste better. And acid was something I was aware of because Brian Jones had been taking acid I think he was the first person I knew who took acid, and that was in 65. And we had a couple of funny acid-related experiences, but I never took acid. When I came to do Between the Buttons, the whole drug culture was clearly affecting the music. It wasn't just part of the lifestyle, it was part of the creative process. I had this idea of shooting Between the Buttons, and I wanted to try and create a trippy, sort of acidy, druggy feeling to it. And so I put a piece of glass in front of my lens and I smeared it with Vaseline and I blurred the edges and I sort of took them off into a blur, which I thought was sort of an imaginary acid, trippy look, but I had no idea. 
John Crittle was hounded by the local police. That's how he lost his driving license. And then he was busted for dope by a certain Detective Sergeant Pilcher, who was kind of famous back then for pursuing famous people like the Rolling Stones and busting them just for the kudos. The drugs got heavier, the, the music got heavier, the politics intruded, the unrest, the 68 riots, the Vietnam night after night, it became pretty horrid. And we were trying to look forwards and finding a way of re-emerging from the sort of rather tragic, confused end of the 60s. You know, the first thing that happened was that I split up with my girlfriend, Sheila. So that's what led me more into, into the poster work. And then John and I fell out because he wanted to take control of some design aspect of the shop. And I, I thought he was treading on my toes or whatever. Anyway, it's all very silly and childish. I think we'd had enough, basically. Yes, it probably was so stupid that it culminated in that. But yeah, there was all kinds of frictions going on. It was a team, yeah. And it, it didn't work when we split up. I sort of was drifting away, and Sheila was left with the shop. She couldn't cope on her own. She brought in somebody else who eventually took over the shop. The times were changing fast. You know, it was becoming more aggressively political. People were starting to take hard drugs, not, not pot and acid. Uh, they were beginning to sniff things and inject things, and it destroyed. It opened up for people like Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood to then make a point of, of the nihilistic spirit of the time and open up the punk thing. Fashion had changed. The King's Road became a bit of a nightmare. It was a mess of hundreds of boutiques with none of the vision and all the um, greed and ambition to make lots of money. We were all just more relaxed in our ways of dressing, thinking, and being. It showed in the clothes that we wore. In terms of music, it, it was the most um, creative period in, in sort of pop rock. And there hasn't been a period like it since. People always said to me, you know, well, didn't you keep anything? And I, I have started buying things back now, but um, my stock answer to that was, which was true, well, you know, A, we didn't think of it as posterity. We were just doing it for the moment, which is what the whole point of it was. But the other thing I always said was, um, you know, to be quite honest, a pair of 26-inch waist snakeskin tra and trousers would not be a lot of use now. <laughs> it can't come back as it was because there's no more uniforms to buy. And part of the reason the kitchens had to change back then was because our days were numbered. And now one soldier can do what a thousand soldiers did then now. He's joined the push button revolution. I mean, it's cyber warfare now. We just had something which appealed to young kids, bright uniforms, and even today, 50 years later, military fashion never goes out of style. There's always someone, whether it be Ralph Lauren or any of the major fashion houses, always produce a version of military fashion. So we did establish something, you know, and it's still 50 years later, still there. I look back at it now and just think, thank God that they did it, and thank God that these boutiques on King's Road didn't think of the money side of it and just went with their imaginations, because now we're left with all this beautiful art in the form of clothing that we wouldn't have had if people were constrained by the purse strings. We were so self-contained that we didn't want to even cash in on it in any shape or form. It's what it was, it was a moment in time. In a way, kind of making money was being commercial. That wasn't really what the, your life was about. Your life was about creating this sort of culture, being with your friends, doing things, trying to make something different. Once you got a little bit of money, you could go and have some fun, do what you wanted to. You didn't worry about where your next money was going to come from. When you own pieces as well that have got some historic relevance and that information has been passed on, those garments then, they become priceless. They're all golden threads to me. It was quite a sort of small clique at the time. I mean, obviously, you know, the people in bands, groups as we used to call them, actually, you know, they were in show business, so they could get away with it. But the rest of us were 
just doing we were on the streets and it, and it got it was it sounds very weird now but at the time you could actually identify a kindred spirit just by what they were wearing and there weren't that many of us people have an idea that you know england was this this amazing mary quant psychedelia that was everywhere and it wasn't it was tiny it was a tiny few people that were part of that scene what i find now with fashion is that it's so homogenized i mean it's kind of like Everyone wears the same the world over. Well, people are being obsessed with brands and things, you know, Gucci, Fucci, Pierucci, whatever. I mean, I mean, what are people doing there? They just, they think that having a label on them shows their personality. I, I don't see it myself. Not long ago, I did an interview on fashion for Women's Wear Daily with a woman that worked for Vogue. And she came and she had like all the latest collections and all the latest designers. And, and it's very nice. It's very, very nice, but it's not for me. It just, it's not as creative. Anything is exciting if you've designed it and somebody wants to buy it. There's no better compliment to your um, skill. You never know what is hip. You just go by your instinct. And if it becomes hip, so be it. And if it doesn't, so be it. It wasn't like now where you go in a store and mostly they sell gray, green or blue. That's about all you get. You know? There's nothing really flamboyant or interesting. Men dress in a kind of conventional code now. Whereas before, if you had a sort of bright, green jacket people go wow that's amazing oh i'd love to wear that how much is it you know even for me growing up in the 70s men just wore really boring clothes so to me to see those clothes and think whoa this was really exciting and to me that also then it shows where menswear is now you know i think that really shows that you can see that development that men's clothes are as exciting as they are and we can wear those bright patterns now and that's where it starts you know, we do so much that it's what's next, what's, um, what's exciting to, to myself and my team that we're working on, um, and what works with our DNA, because I think a lot of it is not just about designing, it's about we've created a DNA for the brand, and you want to continue to evolve and build that DNA. That whole hippie look, it's very loose, it's very laid back, and people go through a period I mean, it's in whatever cycle they go through, eventually, from all the aggression that you get, there will be a cycle where you want to be laid back. You know what? Flowers and flowing clothes and bright colours uh, may come in. And this all goes back to fashion. So, yeah, there, there is a revolution in, in the fashion and it always will be. You know, I might be feeling low for whatever reason. If I'm going out and I, you know, put on a pair of velvet trousers and, and a satin shirt, it just lifts me immediately, you know, despite what people might think in the, in the outside world. So yeah, fashion will always be revolutionary. When you talk about music and fashion together, it can be very, very revolutionary. And I think that's the thing, like whether it's Lady Gaga or Madonna or, Prince or whoever it's been over time, it's that moment that somebody captures everybody's imagination by their persona kind of engulfed within this whole style um, aspect of it as well. You see him here, you see him there. His dress cloth shirt, his velvet flares Don't be offended, he's transcended Peace and love are open-ended His outfit's quite the doozy, go ask Susie He walks King's Road like he's in a movie Dressed to the nines and Granny's finest finds Passers-by, they always say he's quite the bloody dandy You know he is, you know he is So do the kids, so do the kids You know he is, you know he is A dandy with a passion for fashion He loves
loves to hop from shop to shop. They call him a rake and they call him a fop. Make no mistake, he's hip as a whip. His style designed to never flop. He's quite the dandy, go ask Mandy. His hair is longer than her mini skirt. His bells are loud, but he's an introvert. And passes by, they always say he's quite the bloody dandy. You know he is, you know he is. So do the kids, so do the kids. You know he is, you know he is. A dandy with a passion for fashion. Androgyny has set him free He's a masculine, feminine prodigy Silk scarf is wrapped around his neck Patchwork satin discotheque He's a daffodil in the latest clobber If looks could kill, he'd beat Jack the Ripper Girls and boys, they both want his number Passers by, they always say he's quite the bloody dandy You know he is, you know he is So do the kids, so do the kids You know he is, you know he is A dandy with a passion for fashion Passion for fashion. He's a dandy with a passion for fashion. You know me.